Hello, this is Mr. Field and this is my video on states of matter. Before you watch this video, make sure you're comfortable with the basics of chemistry. So, you know, make sure you know terms like atom, molecule, element, compound, mixture, and so on. Now, in this video, we are going to be talking about the structure and properties of solids, liquids, and gases. Then we'll talk about state changes before we look at how to interpret state change data. Um, and then finally, we'll look at heating curves. Okay, so let's start off by looking at solids. Uh, for example, things like stone, wood, metal, and ice. Now, in a solid, the arrangement of particles is that they're regular. You can see that here, the way the particles are arranged in neat regular rows. Uh, in three dimensions, it would be layers. And also, the particles are touching. There are no spaces between them. Now, in terms of the motion of the particles, the particles are just vibrating around a fixed point. That's what these little vibration lines here are trying to show. So they're not moving around, they're just vibrating. Now this leads to the properties of solids. So solids have a fixed shape um, because the particles can't move. This also means that solids can't flow. You know, Imagine putting some pebbles in a funnel like that. The pebbles won't flow through the funnel because solids can't flow. They have that fixed shape. And finally, solids can't be compressed, the re um, and that's what this here is showing. The reason why is because there are no spaces in between the particles to allow them to be compressed. Okay, so next up we've got our liquids. For example, things like water, oil, milk, and ethanol. Now, the arrangement of particles in a liquid is random, so there are no nice neat rows anymore. They just look all jumbled up um, like that. Um, and the particles are touching. Now, it's important to recognize that there are some of these kind of small gaps like that, but really the particles are touching in just the same way that they are in a solid. Um, um, but this time, big difference with the particles is that they are moving. They're not just vibrating, but the particles are sort of moving around all over the place, just going on this sort of continual, never-ending little journey. Now, this leads to the properties of liquids. So number one is that they take the shape of their container. So, for example, the water in this funnel is funnel-shaped, whilst the water in this flask is flask-shaped. Wherever container you put them in, they take that shape. Um, the particles can, or, or liquids rather, can flow, and that's because the particles are able to move. So this liquid in the funnel here is able to flow through it because its particles can move very different to a solid where it wouldn't flow. And lastly, um, what this diagram here is showing is that liquids can't be compressed and the reason why is because there are no spaces uh, in between the particles. Okay, so let's look at gases then. For example, things like water vapor, oxygen, nitrogen, and air. Now, in these, the particle arrangement is random again. You can see there's no pattern there, and they are spaced far apart. You can see these large gaps in between the molecules. Now, in terms of the motion, the particles are moving really quickly, which is why we've got these arrows and these little speed lines trying to represent that fast motion. Now, this leads to their properties. So um, gases expand to fill their containers, and that's because the particles can move and they're not attracted to each other. Gases can flow really well. Again, that's because the particles can move. And also, gases can be compressed, which is what this is showing here. Now, when you compress gases, these large spaces between the particles just get reduced to much smaller spaces, so the gas takes up less space. Therefore, it can be compressed. Okay, so state changes. This is where substances change from one state to another. Now, there are six of these. Um, the first one we talk about is melting, which is when a solid becomes a liquid. Um, and equally, when we, um, a liquid turns back into solid, we call that freezing. When a liquid becomes a gas, we call that evaporation. Um, sometimes we call that boiling, depending on how hot it is when it's happening and how fast it's happening. Um, and we can have um, gas turning back to a liquid, which we call condensation. And then finally, the two harder ones, when a solid turns straight into a gas, we call that sublimation. And when a gas turns straight back into a solid, we call that deposition. Now, these state changes are all reversible, which means we often call them physical changes because no new substance is being made. We're just changing what state something is. Now, to understand in a bit more detail what's going on here, we need to think about something called intermolecular forces, which are these fairly weak forces that hold particles together. So, for example, in a solid, we've got these strong intermolecular forces. We can see that represented down here on this diagram. Um, so these sort of blue springs are supposed to represent these stronger intermolecular forces that are holding our solid particles close together. Now, 
in a liquid, we've got much weaker intermolecular forces. And we can see that represented here by these kind of little blue strings that you can see on that diagram holding those atoms in place. And then finally, in a gas, we've got no intermolecular forces whatsoever. And that's why gases are able to expand into space because there's nothing holding the particles near each other. Now, importantly, when we're melting or evaporating or subliming, um, energy is being used to break those intermolecular forces like that or like this, right? Um, and when we do the opposite processes, so when we do freezing, condensation and deposition, energy is released by forming intermolecular forces. So we break intermolecular forces with melting, evaporation, sublimation, and we make them during freezing, condensation and deposition. OK, so how do we know the state of something at any given temperature? That comes down to a combination of its melting point which is the temperature at which a solid melts. So any temperature below this and a substance will be solid. It also depends on the boiling point of a substance, which is the temperature at which a liquid boils. So any temperature above this and the substance will be a gas. And if we're somewhere between these two temperatures, then a substance will be a liquid. Now, linking back to the previous slide, um, the stronger the intermolecular forces of a substance are, the higher the melting and boiling points will be. So let's look at some examples in practice. Now, what about water at minus 34 degrees Celsius? Well, the melting temperature of uh, water is zero, and minus 34 is less than that, which means that it would be solid um, at minus 34 degrees Celsius. What about methane at minus 150 Celsius? Well, we've got the melting point of methane is minus 183, and the boiling point is minus 162, and minus 150 is above the um, boiling temperature. So at this point, the methane would be a gas because it's higher than its boiling point. And lastly, what about gold at 1450 Celsius? Well, the melting point for gold is 1063. The boiling point is 2966. We are between those two at this point. So at that temperature, gold would be a liquid. Now you do not need to remember any melting and boiling points except for water where you need to know that the melting point is zero and the boiling point is 100 Celsius. OK, so now we're going to look at the heating curve for a pure substance, in this case, water. Now, heating curve is a graph showing what happens to the temperature um, over time as you heat a substance. Now, let's imagine we're starting with ice. You might expect the temperature to produce a nice straight line graph like that. Um, uh, and in fact, it doesn't. And so we need to try and explain why. And, and what actually does happen. So when we start heating our ice, to begin with, the temperature does increase, but only until the melting point of zero. And then the temperature stays flat whilst it's melting until all the ice is fully melted. And only then does the temperature start to increase again. But again, after a while, once we get to 100 degrees Celsius, the melting point, the graph levels out again and the water starts boiling. And only once all the water is boiled does the temperature increase again. So what's happening here? Well, Normally, whilst we are heating our substance, the heat energy is used to make the particles move faster. And that's what's happening in these sloping sections of the graph. However, when we get to our state changes, so 0 and 100 Celsius, what's happening instead is that energy is being used to break the intermolecular forces, which we show in blue on these diagrams. So when we're melting our solid, energy is being used to break these blue intermolecular forces here. And equally, when we're boiling our liquid, energy is being used to break these blue intermolecular forces. And so that's why the graphs flatten out during state changes. Now, if we look at the heating curve for a mixture, the kind of the big difference is that uh, initially the temperature increases steadily. But when it gets to the state changes, although the graph becomes less steep, it does not flatten out. And the reason why is because the different components of a mixture change state at different temperatures. So it kind of melts over a range of temperatures rather than all in one go. And you've all experienced that when you've had a bar of chocolate um, that you've kept in a pocket or something. You know, it won't be completely solid, but it's also not completely liquid. It goes through a kind of gooey stage where it's half melted and half not. OK, so that's it. The end, as always, well done if you got this far.